Well, hello and welcome to another edition of the Endless Coffee Cup Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Matt Bailey. I hope you've got a hot, fresh cup of coffee brewed up or tea, as in the case of our next guest, Mike Stebbins. Mike is a tea drinker, but that does not stop him from making a stop by the Endless Coffee Cup. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm getting caffeinated. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, Mike, you have been on the show, but it's been a while. Uh, I think the last time uh, you were on my show, I was in your living room and we recorded a podcast then. There's a photo of that somewhere. Yeah. 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 So we, we've done a couple, but not recently because you've obviously been busy and you have written a new book. I'm excited to talk about this on the podcast, The Backwards Entrepreneur. What do you mean by a backwards entrepreneur? You know, funny thing too, Matt, is um, we did an informal poll as to whether backwards plural or backwards singular was the right name. And um, I had used backwards plural for years, taught, thinking as we were writing this, because it took a few years to write this. In the informal poll, backward was the proper way to say it. Right. But most people used the phrase backwards. So we ended up dropping the S and I still call it backwards entrepreneur. You yeah. know, the <laughs> name came up and I tell this, it's in the prologue in the story. It's actually in the description on Amazon of where that came up because I never put a name to this methodology I used to building companies. And John Marshall and I had built several companies together. I don't know which one we were at. But Matt, we were sharing a cheap folding table, probably the one sitting here to my left, <laughs> in an office with a sloping floor and bad air conditioning. And I'm typing away on my laptop and John's working and he says something to the effect of, you know, Michael, in his charming British accent. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which I'm not going to try to fake. He can say anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he says, you tend to back into strategies. And I was wounded. <laughs> John, that sounds like an insult. And he quickly said, no, not at all. He says, it's made us a fortune. He goes, you need to teach it to other people. And what he was talking about was this methodology that I would, before I made a product, before I decided what was in the product, before I decided what the pricing was, or even how it was going to be presented, I would call people. And instead of just asking the lame question, would you buy this, to which everybody says yes and let's hang up the phone, I would say, what would you not buy? Or maybe a more qualified question would be, what budget would you take from to buy this? And the answer for our first product ideas was typically none. You know, I couldn't get approval for it. Now, they'd always compliment the idea. They're, oh, great idea. You know, everybody's polite. They just want off the phone, Matt. Right, right, right. <laughs> they just want off the phone. They want to make you feel good and get off the phone. And so if you ask a qualifying question that gets their brain off of, I want to get off the phone, I want to make this person feel good, then you can start getting real answers. And so I think in the example I give in the book, the situation was we were thinking we were going to teach just web analytics and courses. And folks said, I wouldn't take that from any budget. But if you taught paid search advertising or if you taught SEO, I could take that from my advertising budget and I would buy that. And so what happened is the customers were telling us what they would buy and how we needed to describe it to them so they would buy it. And that informed what we did and what we said. And that was backing into a strategy because a lot of people run with the idea first and ideas are both good and bad. Their great idea or how excited we are as founders about some particular product or business idea informs what we do and what we say, and then the customers aren't ready for that. And so we meet an untimely failure, sometimes two years and two bank accounts later. <laughs> and so backing into strategies was a habit that I had formed over the years because I had seen too many failures. And I think you have to stuff your pride a little bit or your, your excitement about your beautiful, precious idea and let potential customers walk all over it in a very honest and revealing way that basically ends up saying, your precious idea isn't going to work. And unless you're willing to do something in a way that the customers or potential customers understand it and are willing to part with their hard-earned money, 
and their internal budget fights to buy it. Um, or on the consumer side, you know, just open the wallet and take that pain on their own budget. These things uh, won't come to fruition unless they tell us how we need to make it and do it. Now, uh, just a quick qualifier on that, Matt, a little giveaway in the book. It says, finish this classic sentence. The customer is always what? Right? <laughs> Wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, no, close, you know, yeah. most of the time, right? Well, it, let me put it this way. If a good friend of mine, she's been on the podcast a couple of times. She runs an agency. She told me the other day, she says, I have no worries about losing any work to AI. She goes, because my clients cannot describe what they want. Yeah. And so if they can't do it to me, they can't do it to chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> so that famous attribute, the customer is always right, is attributed to Selfridge, who was a department store, I think, in London at the turn of the century, give or take. And um, I think the intent was right. It was to take care of the customer and to make sure their perception is good. And I, I have to say that statement is true always when it has to do with the customer's perception. You can't argue with the customer perception, okay? If they feel like your company is horrible or great, it's really hard to argue with that. However, the customer is usually wrong when it comes to how to run your business. And so when I hear customers say, you should, <laughs> <laughs> mm, you wanna listen and you wanna consider it, but generally you as the founder are responsible for how you run your business, how you implement and what you do. So while we listen to our customers as to what they will buy, and how they need to hear about our product in order to buy it, those things are sacred, right? But how we implement and how we do that is up to us, the founders. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me take a quick step back and, and like, let's establish a few things here. Number one, the name of the book is From Idea to 20 Million. And the funny thing is, as I'm reading this book, and I'm, I've worked with you now, I think, on three of the companies, so I've had a front row seat to how you've built, managed, and sold each of those ventures. So you've got the credibility when it comes to building a business, exiting the business, and, and you're bringing a completely different way of approach, I almost an anti-MBA approach. So, you know, Mike, what's your credibility in this field? What, have, what gives you the authority to write this book? First off, when you need authority, my answer to people is take it. That's another matter. Um, <laughs> you start a, a certification body. What were your qualifications for that? Well, we said we're the certification body. <laughs> and then you fulfill it. One of the qualifiers on the book is the 20 million part. And um, that is an accurate number in terms of the valuation of some of the businesses that have been acquired. In some cases, I would just put it this way. We were lucky on reinvesting some of the payout uh, in the combined entity and that paid off well. But I put that top limit on it because really that's the limit of my expertise. Taking a company public to the tunes of hundreds of millions, getting venture capital and a you know 300x return, that's not my expertise. I'm a big fan. You know, I love watching people do that, but that isn't really what I wanted to share. What I wanted to share was kind of in the you know, lower to middle niche of something that works well. In fact, you'll see in the um, scaling section that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious about VC, venture capital investment. I'm not against it, but it definitely has its costs. But, you know, in terms of the companies, you know, we can start with, I grew up in a family that had an independent business. Uh, as I revealed for the first time on one of your earlier podcasts, my earliest career was an auto mechanic right? And watched dad run the family business. And it was successful. Lots of employees, lots of happy customers, but you know, lease payments, parts, inventory, payroll, taxes, uh, EPA containment of chemicals, <laughs> government regulation. And, you know, it just kind of got a rooting in that. Then Matt, I had kids. And even though I had just this eagerness to run my own thing, I decided to wait until the kids were 18 before I ran my own company. So I was involved in large companies, Silicon Graphics, Fujitsu, small companies, startups, but usually in an executive role. Okay, never CEO. I joined ClickTracks, I believe it was in 2004. John Marshall was CEO of ClickTracks. I think that's probably about the time you and I met. 
My role at ClickTracks was to grow it to acquisition. But John was CEO, he carried the burden. And so together we built that to acquisition. Halsey, I think it was JL Halsey bought that for close to the number that's mentioned in the book there uh, that's publicized. And then when we got that acquired, it was really cute because at the closing dinner, Lisa, John's wife, puts her hand on mine and she says, Michael, thank you. She goes, you've done really well for us. And she said, the next one's yours. She said, I want my husband back. And I just really thought that was a neat thing, right? You know, and it also, though, left the burden or the weight of the burden of being the CEO or the main leader of an entity was pretty heavy, right? So, you know, we started Market Motive together, um, switched roles. This time John was uh, COO, I believe. <laughs> I mean, something, right? We had quite an overlap in our skills, which was good and bad. Built that to acquisition. During that time, I went out and acquired a website called Brainwaves Toys. We got a warehouse uh, here in Santa Cruz County, sold education toys. And I don't know if you worked with that site, but a lot of the things we were teaching in Market Motive became the basis for uh, digital marketing for this e-commerce company. And it also was the pincushion voodoo test. So we got it banned off of Twitter, we got, I mean, it was just, we tested all the limits, but somehow it climbed. Uh, articles were written about it. It was doing so well, Matt, that we had to sell it because we were losing our Christmases, shipping toys, and it was distracting us. Like a good idea will distract you from your main objective. And so we sold it for a very favorable multiple. Market Motive was acquired. That's pretty much, you know, public news. From that, I started OMCP. Grew that for uh, four years or more, and uh, that became a standards body, quite ubiquitous, a lot of universities. You contributed quite a bit to that, Matt. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's time for another venture. And so that one, I wanted to a group who would really take it to the next level in terms of community, and that was NISM. So they acquired OMCP, I think it was last October. And um, great relationship with Jennifer and the NISM folks. They were the right people to take it. I'm really pleased to see it growing uh, much faster than it would have with my partial attention. So those are the companies I can talk about. The rest of them have been clients that we've helped grow the companies to acquisition. And I think there's a few more on the horizon. Cool. Well, I know every time you and I get together, we probably spend at least a half a day just telling each other our ideas. And it's one of the things I look forward to, you know, Stacy knows that as well. She's every once in a while, she just kind of blurts out. She's like, you just need to sit down with Mike. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> you guys just need some time together out on the deck. Yep. Yeah. Your head's just filling up with all this stuff. And that's what you're doing in the book is, you know, one of the things is you have a lot of ideas and you need to have them shot down. You need to have them someone there to poke holes in them. Otherwise, like you said, you just become so much in love with them. That that important time of just that initial reaction. And that's what I like about what you've done in the book. And that's what we do together is let's push it a little further. Let's just not shoot it down. You know, let's evaluate it and start to ask those questions, which gets to the, you know, the gauntlet. I love <laughs> explain the gauntlet. <laughs> well, first let's get into some of the ideas, but then how does that lead into the gauntlet? Yeah. So first off, I realized that not everybody suffers from addiction to ideas. Karen, my wife, notices this about day five of a vacation. I can't take it anymore. I'm looking at development and real estate and business opportunities everywhere. And, you know, it, basically what I learned to do was write them down. But it's interesting, Matt, because I'm going out and speaking on these topics. I'm teaching this kind of stuff. And um, when I started doing this earlier, I noticed a few people would kind of look at their shoes when I would talk about all these ideas. And it dawned on me that not everybody has this. It's not a gift. In some ways, it's a burden because... Each idea, or what I call selective optimism, each idea seems like it's going to be a winner. And it's very painful to have so many ideas uh, because you don't want them to die. And so, yeah, so the first, the first half of chapter one, <laughs> sorry, chapter two is how to rank 
your ideas to know which ones need attention. And by the way, for the ones that don't make it through the gauntlet, which I'll describe in a second here, the ones that don't make it through the gauntlet need to be given away, given away to somebody. You know, um, you don't need to hide it, you know, or put it in the closet so nobody else can benefit from it. If you're not going to pursue it, then be generous with it. And I think there was somebody who used to teach that, you know, every business idea you have, even if it was going to be the one you pursued, share it with everybody. And that made me nervous, you know, but the thought process behind that is sound because really it's the bank accounts and the investment and the effort that you put into these that separate you from so many other people. So like I say, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's an entrepreneur's talent to be able to set aside all but the one and to focus on the one. It's also an entrepreneur's talent to take what we imagine into reality. And that journey is a difficult one. I get a lot of dreamers. Uh, I mentioned in the book how frustrated I would get when people would present an unvetted idea. And I called myself the benevolent Grim Reaper. I, I would shoot ideas down and I felt like I was doing people a real, I was doing them a favor, right? But when I saw the slumped shoulders, you know, and somebody walking away, this is when Karen piped up and she said, you know, you may want to consider a different approach. <laughs> she said, maybe ask them to tell you more <laughs> and then shoot down the idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love what you said about giving them away, because I think also part of an entrepreneur's makeup is developing other entrepreneurs. I mean, the reason you're doing this is because you want to change something, you want to improve something. And that naturally extends to people. And so I love that idea of just most of my ideas, it's time. I have no time to do any of that. And so I can easily shoot it down or I can run it by Stacy and she'll shoot it down for me because I have no time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to do it. And so, yeah, it's I love that idea of just, you know, give it away. Don't just you know, hoard it. There are, like you said, there are people that would love to come up with an idea. They just need that push, maybe not as creative, but they've got the tools ready. They just need something to do. I'm going to bring up the idea gauntlet here so I don't misquote it. So I'm going to search my own website here, Matt. I'm uh, going to growingtwice.com. Uh, and, you know, you'd think I'd have this memorized. There are four components. There we go. They're real simple. So there are four components to the idea gauntlet. The idea here is that we take a business or product idea and we run it through four tests. And they're detailed more in the book, but here are the four tests. Okay, number one is what we call the fortified beach test. And I, I got to say, this is the quickest one to take down an idea, right? Is somebody else already doing this well enough? And well enough means that you know, it's good enough for people to buy. They're satisfied. There's not a whole bunch of pain. Number two is what we call the sustainability test. Is it likely to be profitable to make, promote, and sell to a market that I can reach? There's a lot in that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, number two, or number three, sorry. Number three is a protection test. Does it need some type of protection like a patent? And is it protectable? And then number four is the funding test. Is it probable that I can get the required capital for this idea. And if it passes all four, then it's likely that it's worth your time and attention. If it doesn't, give it to somebody else. I love those four aspects because it's competition, it's future of the sustainability question, but also there's legal and monetary. I, I mean, there's four aspects of it that I think are so critical that sometimes as entrepreneurs, like you said, we get in love with the idea and, and we get focused on maybe one or two of those areas that there's opportunity. And I love how you said this in the book because it drives me nuts when people say they've got a million followers. If we just get 1% of that, how many times have I heard that? And I have to tell people, you cannot look at it that way. It's not a simple math equation. And when you're talking about social media, you should be looking at 0.0001% of those million might do something. Yeah, that 1% is far removed from where we are today. <laughs> yeah, and sustainable is fine. I mean, in a lot of cases, the goal here, especially from the you know methods from idea to 20 million, isn't necessarily to walk away you know, soaked with income and, and wealth, it's in some cases to have a sustainable business. And I talk about that in the scalability chapter, 
Why do you want to scale? In fact, that reminds me, Matt, long ago I was vetting and I was talking to you as one of the stakeholders in OMCP and I said, Matt, what question would you put on an exam? You're going to, Susie, you're going to remember this. I said, what question would you put on an exam to measure digital marketing skills? And your answer, Mr. Flippant, was why? <laughs> and I'm like, that doesn't work for multiple choice, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're assessing scaling your business and what it'll take to do that, that is one of the questions. Why do you want to scale it? Is it to change more lives? Is it to make more money? Do you really want to do this? Because maybe a lifestyle business is what you want. Maybe you're at a point in your life where that is more rewarding than trying to really put pedal to the metal. So why is a very valid question when it comes to... Well, that's what I told you. It needs to be an essay. You can't test. <laughs> you know, and, and, and here I'm going to rant about multiple choice tests because it doesn't measure true knowledge and intent. And, you know, prime example is we were talking to a client. They'd been through multiple agencies. And I, one of the first questions I asked him, I'm like, well, what do you want to do with this business? What's your goal? And, and he, he kind of looked at me. He's like, no one's ever asked that. And then we found out his goal was to be acquired within three years. So I'm like, okay, SEO is out of the picture. It, you know, that's a waste of time. Everything's got to be paid immediate. And, and you know, he's just kind of looking around like, if I don't know where you want to be, then that way, especially in this world of digital marketing, building a business, you know, do you want to make a million? Do you want to sell? Do you want to be it? Or do you want your name to be in the headlines? You know, when you know that, then you're going to approach things very, very differently. Yeah. In the first chapter, it asks that. It's like, I will know I'm a successful entrepreneur when fill in the blank. If you want to be, you know, in the news every day, then do what Elon did. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. You'll, you'll be talked about. You're absolutely right. And that is actually, I think that's the first exercise in the book. And each chapter, as you've seen, Matt, it, it has little napkin size exercises. And I'm a big fan of, you know, it's got napkins here, right? It's a big fan of it needs to fit on a napkin. Right, The basis for every business that I formed started with a napkin sketch. And I'll know I'm a successful entrepreneur when, you know, finish the sentence, you know, this is sustainable to make and market with these numbers. You know, here's my cost to make them. Here's my cost to sell them. Here's my cost to acquire. And these should be simple, not waste a bunch of time. In fact, that's why a lot of times the subtitle of the book, when I change it, you know, in descriptions and the like is the fast track to 20 million because you don't spend a whole lot of time on this stuff. There's a chapter in here about guiding statements and, you know, people say, well, you got to have a mission statement. You have to have a, um, a whole bunch of guiding statements. And it's like, yeah, those are good. They're important. Put them up on the wall, but don't waste a whole bunch of time. No, you do. I mean, you do need a guiding statement, you know, otherwise you're all over the place. And I, you remember seeing them up on the walls at the last few companies, but you know, I mean, people will waste so much time and thrash and have committee meetings and outside consultants and the like. And it's like, it put, it says, look, you know, napkin sketch, couple hours, have some people pay attention to this, put it up on the wall and move on. Hey everyone, this is Matt and thanks for listening. Just a quick break in the middle of the podcast here to let you know there's a couple ways that you can connect with us. The first is learn.sitelogic.com. That's the learning site where you can see courses on analytics, courses on digital marketing across paid search, SEO, multiple disciplines. And then also you can connect with us on Slack. Go to Slack if you're there and look for us at endlesscoffeecup.slack.com. Connect with us. I'd love to hear from you. Hear what ails you in the realm of digital marketing. Are there courses you need, information that you'd like to hear, or maybe some past guests that you'd like to hear more from? Thanks again for being a listener of the Endless Coffee Cup, and I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, and I love the story of, you know, one person had it early, and your advice to them was, but you're solid in your direction. You know what you want, you know what you're doing, don't worry. And that's kind of like me. And it's funny because you you did this, I think, a couple of years ago. You even said it to me that, Matt, you back into things. Um, <laughs> I was like, 
yeah, I it's do. A compliment. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and I did. I took it as a compliment. But the same way, you know, I look at those guiding statements that as a solo entrepreneur, I have much more freedom to kind of keep that in my head. I know you ask me to verbalize it, it'll probably take me a paragraph. And and I, you know, I even feel like, you know, it's still under under constant refinement. It's still being developed. It's still going on. So if I put it on a wall, it's going to be different two months later. But it's generally the same. It's generally the same goal, the same aim. It's just the words are going to change, the how we do it or something like that. And so I love when you say, like, don't stress on it. That should be a very easy to thing when someone asks you, why are you doing this? You know, one of the simplest versions of that in the chapter is I borrowed from Rand. And that was BX to why. Okay. And Avinash, who we, you know, founded some of these businesses with taught the same thing. People need to know what to expect from you and your social persona as well. I know that when I go read something written by Avinash, it's going to be clever application of analytics to a business strategy. Very reliable, very good stuff. I'm sure we could name a bunch of other people where we know what to expect. So the simplest one is to which audience Am I what solution? And you can put that on the wall. Uh, Fits on a napkin, you know, and then move on. It's a fast track to 20 million because after doing this so many times and helping others do it, you learn very quickly what sucks up the time and doesn't need to. And you can set those things aside or at least give them a nod and then pay attention to them later as you build out. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that has always impressed me I love the story you gave about when you were at Market Motive and you just started calling students and talking to them. Why did you sign up? And I love it because it was a beautiful case study in research. And that's your advice that you give in the book. And it's something you do, which is talking to people. And I think part of the reason people hesitate to do that is because, like you said, they come up with a very basic question, one that doesn't challenge, one that doesn't create thought. You really are good at coming up with questions. The questions you pose in the book, the questions that you've always asked. And so, I mean, I love the story of talking to students and the assumption was they signed up in January, February because it was a brand new year. But the reality was, and I tell this all the time, it was that they just got through being with a month or two of family And they wanted to change their life because they were being compared to an older brother, older sister. I share that story, especially when I'm over in the Middle East. I'll share that story. And that means something to them because it's very much a part of their culture of, you you know, your older brother's a doctor. Boy, that resonates with people. But it's because you asked the right questions and you were actually talking to customers. I mean, how important is that? I, you know, I, I don't think there's any incubator or business advisor who doesn't recommend talking to customers, but the key is the way we ask the questions. And by the way, the way that I teach in the book is not the only way. There's other great ways to do this. It's just what worked for me. So to answer the question, it's the way you ask gets the brain away from thinking about the question. So Here's an example. Actually, I open a lot of my sessions with this. When I hire, I will ask somebody, what are three things that would cause you to get up, throw down your laptop, and walk out of this business forever? Okay? And after the protest, well, I'd never do that. I'm responding, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Whatever. Come on. (laughs) So the first one is always, I would call it reading off the card, right? Oh, well, if somebody was abusive or if there was something, you know, that was a lack of integrity or something like that. It's like, okay, good. What's the second one? And then the people who really did their research, they can read off the second card, right? But when you get to the third one, almost every time, Matt, the eyes go up and to the left and they actually have to immerse themselves into the feelings and the scenarios of what would really rankle them enough to get up and leave. And one gal said, man, if there was a smell of food or if I had to work in cubicles and I look up over the sea of cubicles as somebody's (laughs) burning popcorn in the kitchen and I'm like, you're not going to be happy. (laughs) So it's the same thing when we're doing research and asking questions about product or why something is important to somebody. A good example is asking a potential customer, 
to, first off, you, you say, you know, think of somebody important in your life. You don't need to tell me their name, right? But it's a cousin, a sister, your mom, whatever. How would you teach them to decide how to buy this product? Now, what's happening in the brain is they're thinking of their sister or their mom, and there's concern, there's empathy, there's care, and it takes away from the, I'm just going to say the right thing and move on, okay? And all of a sudden, they have this vision, hopefully, not always, but most of the time they have this vision of teaching their mom how to buy the widget that you're selling. And, you know, mom, make sure if you buy a garage door opener that it has the little sensors to make sure that if, you know, little Mikey walks under, it's not going to close on him, right? Well, now you're hearing the real stuff, okay? And so it's not only talking to customers, but how you ask. And what we're doing is getting the brain into a state where it's telling us the truth and not trying to get off the phone with the right answer. And that's such a strong motivation for people. You know, if you have any kind of reputation and you're on the phone with somebody or they're kind of wowed, oh, it's an executive at this company or they're a startup, you know, they're calling me the customer, anything like that. People just, they, they have this innate need to please or to, you know, inject their own ego or opinion into it. You know, you should or something like that. So I lay out in the book specific methodologies for how to extract those things. And to get that emotional, unfiltered answer that helps you decide what you do and what you say about what you do. Somebody pointed out, I think it was Rand who reviewed the book. Um, he said, be aware, and somebody else actually here in Santa Cruz pointed out, they said, be aware that not everybody has the time and ability to do these kind of surveys. And even though the CEO and the founders should talk to customers, it is an option for them to hire expert help to do this with them and for them. And to be honest, I hadn't really encountered that. I was, to me, I was always fighting tooth and nail. And by the way, a lot of founders will not want to do this, to do the customer calls. And I would do it with them. But it was, it was a valid point. So I just, to, in case somebody's really struggling, you go through the book, you, I think I added it in there. But if you go through the questions and you're really struggling getting potential customers to talk to you in that emotional state, that unfiltered state, then, you know, maybe consider having somebody help you. I mean, we've even done podcasts about how to ask questions. I think it's a skill like any other that has to be developed. There are frameworks you can use to develop and, and you laid one out in the book, which I thought was wonderful, but it is a skill and it's a skill that is really going to help you. It'll help you with employees. It will help you in your day-to-day -day relationships. It has helped me immensely learning how to ask the right questions with raising kids. <laughs> and you can maintain your emotion and ask the right question. It is amazing what that does to relationships. Describe the scenario that you most fear and want to avoid. Yeah, you know, and first one might be off the card, but I'll tell you the second one isn't. <laughs> no, no. No, not at all. And I love that one about what would make you leave because by about that third one, they're going to find a pain point of something that either they did quit because of something or they've been in a situation where, you know, there's fear there and that's going to bring it out and you want to find out what that is. And it also helps you find out what's going to motivate this person. We do ask what would make you stay forever, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if someone says, if I don't get recognized for the work I'm doing, you know, you flip that around, they need recognition. And that's a big pleaser right there. So you can kind of flip the questions back and forth. But I, I get what you're saying is it's when you ask people for three things, <laughs> that is a powerful method of immediately pulling them out of the immediate situation into, like you said, now the eyes are going off. I got to think of something and it, it, it moves the conversation in a completely different way. One of the hiring questions, first off, we would always have somebody interview with one of our employees before they would interview with me if, if that was necessary. And I would tell them, really get the employee to tell you what it's like to work for me because you may not like it. And so when they, if they made it to my office, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say... Uh, so what did you learn? And they said, they'd always say the same thing, that you change your mind a lot. <laughs> it's like, I do. And so I would say, look, the goal of this is to make sure you're happy. It is not a win-lose. I said, you're interviewing us. Okay. So I'd ask, 
How many times do you think you could handle your precious idea getting shot down here before you would not find it to be a comfortable place to work? And I got to tell you that it was my own little bias that if they said, oh, endless, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, then you have no pride in your work. But if they were honest and they said probably two or three times, then we would want to save them from the agony of working at one of my companies. Okay. But if they said well, between eight to 12 times, okay, this is somebody who has some maturity. They're able to separate their identity from a good idea or maybe even able to fight for their idea and be persuasive. But to me, that was a sweet spot. Now, there's all kinds of flaws in that questioning system, but it would generally give us a trend. <laughs> is this person ready to work at a company where our methodologies change dynamically? And why do they change dynamically? Because we're backing into strategies. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. As the founder, I mean, let me ask you th that same question, Mike. How many times <laughs> were your ideas shut down as the CEO? Not very often. <laughs> <laughs> come on now. That's probably why my employees were frustrated sometimes. <laughs> come on now. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> I think customers would shut them down and, you know, the staff would definitely, we were very open to staff input. I think every Friday, if I have that right, at my companies, we would meet and everybody had a say. But the way I set it up, I, I said, look, you know, I will listen and weigh all of your input. And it will have an effect, but you will probably not get your idea the way you see it. And, you know, a lot of people, like, I won't say which company, but a lot of times we were on the hairy edge of making payroll. And, you know, people come in and they come up with a very good idea that required us to spend, you know, let's say $2 million in investment. And I could not look these employees in the eye and say, you know, we're about to go broke. Right. Yeah. Because that's not something you're supposed to tell employees. And so their idea would get shut down. Or we also had a lot of people who were pushing market motive to get into the get rich quick schemes, which I will confess for the first time on a podcast, Matt, those were tempting to me. Oh, absolutely. They drove me mad because I'd see my colleagues in the industry claiming to have, what was it, you know, 10,000 people sign up for $10,000 a year and their servers went down and I felt like I needed to believe some of this and it yeah. made me feel like I was missing out. Shiny idea goes floating by, shoot it down, focus. And I got to tell you, in those instances, it was really valuable to have good co-founders because they would look at me and they, John would grit his teeth sometimes and say, it is hard work and dedication that gets us to that point, not a get rich quick scheme. I'm like, I needed to hear that. Absolutely. And and that's that's the shiny object. That's the panacea that, especially when you're frustrated, is going to distract you. But I, I think overall, going back to what you said, you, you were honest that I'm going to listen, I'm going to consider, and what happens may not be the form, but you were honest with them that I'm going to listen. It's, it's going to be a part of what we decide. And I think that honesty is what an employee wants, is knowing that, okay, that's going to happen. But there is a limit anyone should have where if every idea they come up with, you know, and they really put their heart and soul into it and it doesn't work, can be really discouraging. Now, what I would do in cases like that, because I got to say, in some ways, Matt, that's what drove me to become a founder and a CEO is that I was tired of my ideas getting shot down. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm going to go prove this myself. And I got to give credit to the last, well, one of the companies that I worked for before I ventured out on my own, called me and complimented me. He said, Michael, he goes, I got to congratulate you. You beat us at our own game. And he said, you had all these ideas. I mean, wh what a big person to do that. That was uh, Dr. Frank DeRemer did that. May he rest in peace. He passed away years ago, but he was the founder of a company called Metaware, a compiler company. And I was just driving me mad, Matt, in these meetings. I always felt like I was in the wrong meeting because I'm like, that's not the way this should work. We should do X. <laughs> so I went and did it and it worked. I'm just kind of touched by the memory that he was willing to uh, acknowledge that. But yes, in these situations, if somebody really was getting shut down, I would take them aside and say, look, your idea has merit. There are some reasons that I'm not allowed to disclose because it would make you uncomfortable as to why I can't implement it. And I said, it's completely unfair. I said, just let me tell you this way. If we had good funding, we would definitely pursue that. But right now we have to focus on this one thing. And that would, you know, I mean, they'd still be kind of bummed, but at least they'd know it wasn't just because 
some random shoot down, right? Or you think it's a bad idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, it's a fantastic idea. You know, if we had Just money, bad timing. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One of the things you talk about is, it, you know, as an entrepreneur, you talk about the thrill and the mundane. And I described having a business once as it, when I was a kid, we lived on, on a hill and the school was down the hill. And many, I would ride my bike to school and there were times I had a 10 speed bike and I could go down the hill without hands, you know, and there were times where it was just a little too fast that, you know, I know I'm going way too fast, faster than I should. If something happens, I'm a mess. But yet, wow, what a feeling. And that kind of went to what you were describing, you know, surfing and things like that. That entrepreneurship gives you this thrill, this high, this excitement. But there's always a counterpart to it that we tend to ignore. And I love it. The, right on the onset in the book, you're asking, what do you hate doing? Let's look at that. <laughs> and uh, here it is. I'm looking it up real quick. Uh, <laughs> it says, upon success, you like how we assume success? Upon success, will your role still consist of doing what you love? And then right on the same slide, it says, can you sustain the mundane until you can pay someone else to do it? My advice to people is there's two things. Number one, when you love what you do, it's amazing. However, what happens when you have to manage what you love? It's a completely different world. I told people when I was in the military, as soon as I was promoted to sergeant, and I was in charge of people, in charge of things, oh, my life changed. I hated it. I wanted to get demoted and go back out in the field. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it's different to manage what you love and not doing those day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. And there's some tests in the first chapter that help you decide, you know, what your natural tendencies are, what your abilities, what your habits are. And you'll tend to gravitate towards those. And it's pretty hard. Habits you can change, but the other things, not so much. And, you know, yeah, you can resist those, but resistance takes energy. And so for those things that are less likely to change, your natural attributes, your tendencies, you need to just acknowledge them. And, you know, and, and shape your business around those. And that means hire people who have the strengths where you don't. Or outsource them. Or... As somebody who reviewed the book pointed out, they said oftentimes it's important to um, shape a business model, like maybe solopreneur, right? That makes sense for your strengths. So yeah, it's definitely, there's a nice test in there. One of the efforts, well, actually, I won't tell you what the surprise is. Just take the test. <laughs> Okay, we've got a few minutes left. And I think, Mike, we're going to have to do like two more to cover the rest of some of this context. I just think it's super content. We've got a lot of business owners that listen. We have people that are considering going into business listening. And this is just our entrepreneurship shows tend to do really well compared to others. So definitely we're, we're, we're going to continue this. But the one thing that jumped out to me is, you know, you moved right into office space. Um, you know, idea, mission, vision, office space. And I love how you pointed out, like, don't get distracted by the big shiny office. What are the three most important things when looking for office space, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if I can think I can remember it. I think I said um, it needs to be near good food. That, yes. Walkable distance. Walkable distance to good food, I would add. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I'd have to look it up, Matt. Can you remind me? Oh, my goodness. Well, w considering our early conversation before I hit record, yeah, good AC. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I described that our initial offices in almost every startup had sloping floors. We used folding tables and we had bad AC. And my claim was I'd do it again, except for the bad AC. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the overall point there is you can put off so many investments. You can put off so many things that, that take time. You know, I got to tell you, there's a scene in a movie that features Rodney Dangerfield. It's called Back to School. And while the movie is probably pretty trashy, there's a scene in there where the guy, some wealthy guy portrayed by Rodney Dangerfield is forced or volunteers to go back to school and finish school. And he's sitting in a lecture hall 
and the professor's teaching some business thing, and, and Dangerfield and his character is getting more and more frustrated. And finally, he bursts out and says, that isn't the way it works at all. And he kind of disrupts the whole class, and the professor is very flustered. And, and he says, you know, and the professor's like, oh, how does it really work? And Dangerfield's character goes, well, first, you got to grease the palms of these guys in city council, and then everybody knows you got to make a contribution to this union and stuff like that. And at first, the whole class is horrified. Okay. And then all of a sudden, they realize this is the real stuff. This is how it really works, <laughs> as irreverent and as horrible as it was. And all of a sudden, they all pick up their pens and start writing notes furiously because somebody who has gone the route is telling them how it really works. And I think that's the intent in the book is to sort out what can be delayed. You know, it's like get rid of the backlit logo. You know, it's, you don't need somebody sitting at a desk bored in front. It's like work out of your garage, you know, work out of the shed in the back, work out of a cheap office until you have the means to, you know, grow or it facilitates creativity of, you know, your, your uh, employees. And it's the same thing with saying other things are important. Like I cannot emphasize enough good corporate setup with a very expensive attorney. You know, the first ten or $20,000 that I had in capital for starting one of the businesses, all in to the attorney. Well, what about your office? Eh, we were thinking of a place above an automotive shop. And it was the best decision, Matt. And it's just so it's like, what are the order of priorities in Backward Entrepreneur? It seemed backward. Why would you pay all of your capital to an attorney to set up your business? Granted, it had made it through the idea gauntlet, okay? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and the market was validated, but at that point, no, we didn't go shopping logos. And it's so easy to get distracted, especially with the, the high visibility office space, the, the latest office furniture. It, it amazes me, like, and we talked a little bit about VCs, that that's where VC money goes. Yeah, it, it goes to that. And I love where you said that that's where I, things go to die. Oh, gosh, the place here in Scotts Valley. Yeah, it is so fancy. And... Yeah, I remember it was something like three times a square foot than anything else in the county. And my, it was nice. It had a pool. <laughs> well, and that's where all your capital goes. Yeah. Y you know, and it's just amazing when you sit down and look at the percentage of revenue and then how much goes to lease, how much goes to furniture, how much goes to these types of things, things that are they necessary to productivity? Or do they grow the business? It's the same thing with when do I pay myself? <laughs> well, you pay yourself as soon and as much as you can when it doesn't inhibit the growth of the business, when it doesn't inhibit the growth. And that means paying your employees well first, right? You know, and are your employees productive? You know, then pay yourself, you know, should you pay yourself a lot? Sure. If it doesn't inhibit the growth of the company. <laughs> That's great. Mike, hey, this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. I love the book. I highly recommend it. Uh, those of you on the video, Mike had his copy. I've got mine, Backward Entrepreneur. I know I have to keep, I still want to say that S. So do I. Yeah, it was for years we were saying that. And it's okay if you do. <laughs> okay. All right. Even those of you who have a business, it's, a, it's still a great read. It's going to challenge a couple things and it'll probably give you some ideas for growth. Mike, thanks for making the time to come in. Been a pleasure always, Matt. And thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. I hope you, uh, you know, at least one cup of coffee down through this. But stay tuned. We're going to have Mike on a lot more. We're going to talk through a little bit more of the principles in the book. But thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to our next cup of coffee on the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. You've been listening to the Endless Coffee Cup. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with somebody else. And of course, please take just a moment and rate or review us at your favorite podcast service. If you need more information, contact me at sitelogicmarketing.com. Thanks again for being such a great listener.